So the violence that I will be addressing and suggesting can be reduced is the violence that occurs over the course of intrastate conflicts, um, pitting populations against governments. And so um, what I'm suggesting is the way that populations fight for basic human rights, democratic governance, accountability, um, the way that they fight and the methods that they use, violent or nonviolent, um, certainly affects A, their chances of victory, and B, the type of society um, that they have after the struggle has ended. And so if I were to state my thesis up front, it would be that if nonviolent resistance or civil resistance, which is a method of struggle involving tactics that you're all familiar with, like boycotts, strikes, civil disobedience, non-cooperation, graffiti, political satire, hundreds of tactics. If this method of struggle becomes um, the predominant method of struggle for groups vying for rights, freedoms, and democracy around the world over the next 30 years, we could see a significant reduction in violence. We all know that the violence that occurs over, intra, over the course of intrastate conflicts is, is severe and that civilians are often paying the price. Um, we also know that m the vast majority of mass atrocities occur when governments are confronted with armed insurgencies. Um, so again, the choice of weapons uh, influences the lethality, um, whether or not movements achieve their goals, and as I'll talk a little bit about um, the type of society that comes after the struggle. So, um, so the common claim that one hears is that nonviolent resistance may work you know, when the opponent is benevolent or in a democracy or when um, the state regime, whomever, is not willing to use massive violence against the protesters or the dissenters that it, it, it can work in these cases, but not in cases of dictatorships or where regimes are willing to use um, mass violence against the protesters. You also hear that um, you know, nonviolent resistance can achieve more minimalist goals like women's rights, environmental rights, civil rights, um, but, but um, toppling a regime um, or ending a foreign occupation or achieving ter territorial self-determination is not something that nonviolent resistance can achieve. And then you hear the claim that violence does not always work, and this was a claim that really prompted Erica Chenoweth and I to do this study and write this book. Violence doesn't always work, but it, it's going to succeed more often than nonviolent resistance, particularly against, um, let's say, tough opponents. And so what uh, my co-author Erica Chenoweth and I did was we decided to test these underlying assumptions. Is it true that nonviolent resistance uh, cannot be effective against formidable opponents willing to use violence against opposition? Is it true that violence is always more effective or has a better track record historically? Um, and is it true that sort of structural conditions, regime type, GDP, willingness to use violence, do these structural factors um, either limit or prevent the emergence or success of nonviolent movements? We wanted to test these claims. So she and I uh, compiled a data set called the Nonviolent and Violent Conflict um, Outcomes, NAVCO, data set, which looked at uh, 323 campaigns, violent and nonviolent, from 1900 to 2006. 323 campaigns. And um, these campaigns were in three categories, um, and we did that purposefully. So these were campaigns that were targeting incumbent regimes, um, so authoritarian regimes, dictatorships. They were challenging foreign occupations. Um, in or they were vying for territorial secession or self-determination. And you, so we, we lined up these different campaign types um, and found, quite surprisingly, that nonviolent resistance campaigns were twice as successful as armed in insurgencies in achieving their strategic aims. Um, not only that, but the success rate of nonviolent campaigns has been steadily increasing over time. Um, which was a hopeful finding. We can talk about sort of 2006 to, um, to the present uh, a little bit later. So that, that raised the obvious question of why. Why did nonviolent resistance uh, seem to have a pretty, um, a pretty impressive track record, certainly compared to armed insurgency? So our basic finding um, is that the focus is on the primacy of participation um, and that
uh, nonviolent resistance campaigns tended to have almost 10 times the level of participation as armed insurgencies. And we found that when large numbers of people um, from diverse sectors of society um, participated in a nonviolent campaign, that that contributed and positively correlated with success. The, the basic assumption underlying nonviolent resistance or civil resistance is that no oppressive system, whether it's a dictatorship, foreign occupation, um, corporation f for that matter, no um, system or power holder um, can survive without the cooperation and acquiescence of people who reside in so-called pillars of support underneath them. Pillars of support are organizations and institutions that basically give the power holder power. So they're the, they're the police, they're the military, civil servants, um, state media, full range of organizations, institutions. These pillars are not monolithic and they're not, um, they're not permanent. That the loyalties of those individuals within those pillars of support can shift. And at the end of the day, if enough shifts occur and loyalty shifts occur within these key pillars of support, even the most formidable regime willing to commit mass atrocities will not be able to stay in power. And so we found that um, large campaigns that involved uh, significant participation by workers, by professionals, by women, um, by youth, were more, far more apt to disrupt the status quo, to impose costs, economic, political, other on the, the power holder. Um, and it's much harder to repress um, a resistance campaign that involves lots of people, that's spread out, um, and that's involving different tactics. And there are so many more tactics available to nonviolent resistors than there are to armed insurgents, which makes it possible for elderly women, disabled, large segments of any society to participate, which again makes it a very powerful and formidable force for change. So this just looks at a graph that looks at the participation levels and, um, the, and links it to the probability of success, seeing that positive uh, correlation. And as I mentioned, so basically, you know, more people are able to participate in nonviolent resistance. The physical barriers to participation are lower, so you don't need to be a young, able-bodied man trained in explosive devices to participate in civil resistance. The commitment barrier is lower, so you don't need to be somebody who's a 24-7 rebel. You can be a casual rebel. You can participate in certain tactics, certain campaigns. Um, it doesn't have to be your life's commitment. Uh, the informational bar barriers tend to be lower. Um, it's easier to learn um, about nonviolent campaigns. Uh, when you see people demonstrating, you're able to learn that there is dissent spread out in a society, whereas sometimes when it's an armed, often when it's an armed insurgency, a lot that's happening is clandestine underground, so it's hard to see um, always sort of the, the level of dissent in the society. And cognitive. So in most societies, and I think this, this definitely correlates with Steven Pinker's findings and others, um, pe most people in any given society are not willing to kill for a cause. Um, they may be willing to suffer and to die for a cause, but they're not willing to kill for it. So civil resistance is a strategy that allows people to assert their rights, to fight, to feel like they're fighting and struggling, but without using or threatening violence. So one of the key, um, when I mentioned the pillars of support. So one key um, finding uh, in the study was that we found that nonviolent resistance campaigns were much more likely than their armed counterparts to prompt defections in the security forces. And defections and security forces, as you know, for any regime or occupier is a really critical key pillars of, pillar of support. And so we found that if you think about it, when police and soldiers are confronted with unarmed protesters. Mm -hmm. um, and when the participation base is broad and diverse, such that they could be confronting their sisters, their cousins, their accountants, their imams, whatever, in the crowd, it's much harder to obey orders to shoot and kill. Mm 
I, we don't argue that this doesn't happen. It certainly has in many cases. Nor do we argue that nonviolent resistance works by melting the hearts and minds of people or by you know uh, just winning the moral high ground. That's not how nonviolent resistance works. But the fact that security forces are more likely to defect when they see people um, sort of confronting them with nonviolent means rather than confronting an armed insurgency that's of course trying to shoot them or kill them. It's very hard to co-op somebody you're trying to kill essentially, and so you're much less likely to see. Security force defections um, when uh, security forces are facing armed insurgency. So, so we also begin from the starting point that repression, targeting resistance campaigns, is the norm. It's not the exception. So, the claim that nonviolent resistance can only work if there's not a lot of repression just did not add up with our study. But what we did find is that nonviolent campaigns had again almost uh, had twice. Uh, as effective a track record um, compared to armed campaigns when they were faced with repression. So this whole idea of backfire. So facing disciplined, nonviolent um, protesters is much more likely to backfire uh, on the regime compared to facing armed insurgencies. Uh, we did find that um, sanctions were more likely to follow international sanctions uh, when regimes crack down violently and systematically on nonviolent protesters compared, again, regimes can come up with 101 reasons why they are legitimate in fighting back even disproportionately against armed challengers compared to nonviolent protesters. This whole idea of unsustainability. So even if you know, a regime wants to crack down on protesters. Um, if these are dispersed, spread out, and lots of people are involved, including mainstream protesters, let's say, who may be socially close to the regime, um, it makes it very hard to sustain the repression. So you all know the stories, whether it's you know Iran, for example, where the regime, the Shah, US-backed Shah, was, was challenged by armed uh, insurgents for many, many years before. Um, then you had a mass nonviolent uh, resistance that involved the bazaaris, the merchants, students, um, and others, and religious clergy. Basically, the workers, by going on strike, paralyzed the economy, so the oil sector was shut down. The regime went after them very steadfastly and tried to put everybody in jail, but there's only so many people that they could put in jail. And then they realized that their security forces couldn't run the oil factories, the refineries, the institutions. And so even if they wanted to crack down massively, they could only do so much. So we found also in the study that, and this won't be a surprise to you that um, mentioning all the cases that James cited before about externally driven uh, regime change, military regime change, that armed insurgencies are much more reliant on external sources of support than nonviolent resistance campaigns. So armed insurgencies need guns, they need weapons, they need training, they need sanctuary, they need a whole range of support. If that support is forthcoming, they may win. Um, in, in Libya, you can say that the insurgents achieved the goal of toppling the regime. We can talk about what came after later. But, but if that, that support is not forthcoming, it's very hard for an armed insurgency to achieve victory. Whereas nonviolent resistance campaigns tend to rely a whole lot more on the skills, resources, knowledge, and know-how of the indigenous or local population. So Erica and I were not only concerned about what was more effective at ending occupations and achieving regime change, we cared, frankly, more about what came afterwards. So what's the relationship between the driver of a transition and both the likelihood that a country will relapse back into civil war um, 10 years after the campaign ends and the relationship between the driver of change, violent, nonviolent, and the democracy scores or de democratic consolidation. So on, in terms of democracy scores, we found a very strong positive correlation between um, not, uh, transitions that were driven by broad-based nonviolent coalitions and democratic consolidation um, compared to campaigns that were driven by armed insurgencies, which, as you know, tend to rule by the fist when they come to power and are not necessarily inspired by democratic principles when they come to power. So democratic consolidation seemed to, seemed to be far more prevalent when the driver of that change was nonviolent. We also found significantly that the probability that that country would experience a civil war within, within 10 years of the end of the conflict was 43% for violent campaigns, 
and 28% for nonviolent campaigns. So how you fight determines essentially what comes afterwards. So implications, because um, I wanted to leave it just a, enough time for, for question and answer. As I'm thinking about this conference, it was a little difficult this morning to place this research and sort of this, um, this frame with the wider frame of the conference. But I think um, because there is a lot of focus on sort of interpersonal um, violence, but I think it's still widely recognized that internus and intrastate conflict is a significant cause, cause of casualties and of violence and of deaths. And also that dictatorial regimes tend also and have been historically been responsible for some of the greatest um, you know, atrocities and genocide and the like. And so as I think about where this research falls in the, in the larger um, theme, it just strikes me that you know greater appreciation of the dynamics of this method of struggle and a wider sort of dissemination of knowledge and know-how about how populations can wage struggle nonviolently could contribute to a significant reduction in global violence. So I think part of it is sort of the, the education realm. What I would say in a very uh, practical way is that, and I'm thinking about this more um, since I've left the State Department and having worked for two years on Syria and having um, watched something that began as a nonviolent um, challenge to a terrible regime morph into what we have today, which is a civil war, the question obviously for me became what could external actors, governments, non-government, non-governmental foundations, other, what could they have done and what could they do in the future to create space and to support those engaged in nonviolent campaigns and movements. Um, there's been very little research done on this topic of what types of external support actually assist nonviolent campaigns and movements. So in fact, Erica Chenoweth and I have agreed to write a second book together that looks a little bit at this external actor function. And so what I could see as very practical and useful would be um, the development of a toolkit for external actors that lays out the full range of diplomatic, military, economic, technical, training and education, um, technology related tools that can either A, help create space or an enabling environment for nonviolent mobilization, or B, provide catalytic support to groups, especially nascent nonviolent groups, when they need that support the most. And so I think that's a big project, but it would actually help give external actors ideas in sort of a methodology of thinking about what types of interventions could actually be useful. Um, I also think that, um, you know, there's often a rush in many of these cases when populations are struggling against regimes to think that the armed resistance is going to have the better chance and to put a lot of focus and resources in how can we support, whether it's the Free Syrian Army or whether it's the full range of, you know, different actors, if a bit more thinking went in, creative thinking went into how can we put the best, best brains and tools together to support the nonviolent oppositions in these cases, I think you know, maybe that could help achieve better policy uh, results as well. I also, in the paper, noted that it would be practically helpful if the foundations and other NGOs and non-governmental actors that do give small grants, training and capacity building, whatever, to non-violent activists um, and campaigns and movements, if they could actually come together and, and collect best practices and lessons learned about how, what it means to provide small grants effectively, what types of support seems to be the most promising. Again, this is not something that has um, happened, but it would be extremely helpful. Finally, and this is a bit wonky and a little bit in my field, but there are two um, publications that have come out that are meant to be toolkits for diplomats and for military professionals. So one is called the Diplomats Handbook for Democracy Development Support. And basically, this is a toolkit for dip diplomats to use to effectively engage civil societies, dissidents, and to support democratic transitions. And I think if this handbook were much more widely disseminated and known in diplomatic circles, not just in the United States, but in other countries, that this could, again, help give ideas to diplomats how they, out in post, out in the field, can best support civil society and nonviolent campaigns and movements. Another publication, um, for those interested in the security forces in particular, is a publication called Military Engagement, 
um, which is on how um, militaries and security forces from democratic countries can influence the behaviors of security forces in non-democracies, either through military education, through personal contacts, you know, picking up the phone when, when people are protesting and just warning that it may not be a good idea to obey orders to shoot at peaceful protesters, um, you know, for everything from the freezing of assets. So it includes a whole range of tools that security forces Forces can use. And this is important because, at least in my country, we tend to have military relations with a lot of non democratic countries, and they're strong military relations. So the question is how can you use those military relations and leverage them to support, again, non violent change processes? So I will leave it at that and leave some time for QA. Thank you very much.